Hi, everybody. Um, at, at, it was at EDM, we failed to get together. Mm -hmm. it sort of tries to believe us. And so I wound up uh, finding when uh, Ryan would be here and, and invite him up to my group. And then I suddenly realized, hey, wait a minute. This guy's really fantastic. We ought to share him. So I convinced uh, Molly to, uh, to invite him. And so, uh, well, I'd like to go through the whole resume, but I will, um, I will just start with, I think, the first thing that really indicates Ryan's lifelong interest of, uh, of education, and that is that he worked in the Office of Education for the SSC. How many people know what the SSC was? <laughs> like one. It, it was a su super conducting, a super collider, yeah. and it was CAN. But he did this in 1992, which is some time before he graduated from college. I think you may have barely been a teenager when you 15. were 15. 15, okay. 15. <laughs> and uh, his career has followed where you think it might have gone since then. Uh, and you know, <coughs> what impresses me is the super research that he's done. Uh, really, I regard him as one of the major founders of educational data mining and of the conference that bears that name. And uh, he's measured short-term learning, modeling students and their behavior, including students gaming the system. I mean, we, many of us start off trying to find out about learning, and one of the first <coughs> things we discover is, you know, these kids are cheating, <laughs> or some significant fraction of them. And then you have to figure out what they're doing, or gaming the system, whatever elegant word you use for it. Um, and uh, he teaches a MOOC in Big Data in Education, but he's won, and I think this is pretty, pretty impressive, or his he and his students have won on the order of 10 best paper awards at different meetings. I think that's, that's impressive. And uh, I think uh, I would just say, you know, Ryan is one of the foremost people in, in this whole collection of, uh, you know, learning analytics conference, whatever, who is first of all interested in learning and secondly never forgets that we're actually teaching real people. And with that, I'll let Ryan talk. Yay. Thank you, Dave, for the kind words. Uh, that means a lot coming from a you know, researcher who's done so much to contribute to education as you have. And thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to start by inviting you all to please interrupt me whenever you'd like. Um, <clears throat> I, I like interruptions. If we don't cover all my slides because of interruptions, then I'm still happy. Um, so in recent years, more and more learning occurs in interactive learning environments and MOOCs, millions of learners a year. Um, here's an a image of some different systems that are being used in American education today. Top left, you have Inkits, which is a system where students uh, conduct science inquiry processes to learn science by working with simulations. There you see a simulation of dropping objects off of the Tower of Pisa in Italy, a experiment that most American students cannot themselves do. Um, my kids and I tried uh, throwing different objects out of our window in New York. Um, and aside from uh, the landlord coming up and yelling at us, uh, it worked, we learned. Uh, bottom left is Physics Playground, a system uh, used by middle school and high school students, uh, developed by Val Shute at Florida State, where uh, you have to solve physics puzzles that involve implicit understanding of uh, simple machines of force and motion by drawing objects, having them come to life. Uh, upper middle, we have a shot from um, EcoMove at Harvard, a system where students learn by going around a, a virtual environment and solving mysteries. Right side, we have assistments from Worcester Polytechnic, uh, you know, near, near Cambridge. Um, actually, I just realized everything on this slide except one is from Massachusetts, but that just underscores what a big role Massachusetts plays. Um, assistments is a system used by 50,000 kids a year in Massachusetts and Maine to do their math, uh, classwork, and homework. It assesses while it assists, helps them learn, but provides formative reports to teachers. And the bottom uh, middle, we have a shot from an MITx course. So some systems and courses can be really engaging. Everyone gets really excited by the potential of online learning for many reasons. One of them is that they, they think, oh, having kids use software in class will be so much more fun than sitting and listening to a teacher. 
<clears throat> but it turns out that there's considerable variation in engagingness. I really want to walk over there and start pointing to bars, but I've been told not to do it, so I'll be, a, I'll be good. But I want to point out that if we look at the percent boredom measured in these different environments by my research group, we can see that it varies from just barely above 0% for the EcoMove system I showed you to almost 25% uh, for the assistance platform. And in the middle, and by the way, assistance is a great platform, has a lot of great attributes, but it does have relatively higher boredom. In the middle is a system called Math Blaster. Who here has played or heard of Math Blaster? It's a game. It's an award-winning game. It's a very, very boring award-winning game. <laughs> it's very repetitive. Has, you throw bananas at monkeys, and the cuteness of the game and the delight moments kind of wear off very quickly. And the fact that it's basically just drill with some game elements on it, chocolate-covered broccoli, as Amy, Brock, uh, Amy Bruckman calls it, come out. <laughs> So is this important? It's important because affect and engagement in online learning, and I'll define these terms in just a minute, predicts student outcomes even several years later. Work by Maria San Pedro, Sweet San Pedro, grad student of mine, former grad student of mine, now at ACT. <clears throat> Over the last 14, 15 years, our group has developed measures of engagement and affect that are, first of all, automated. So they're able to make assessments about students in real time with no human being in the loop. They can just look at what a student's doing in the system, figure out if they're engaged or bored. Fine-grained, able to make assessments about students second by second. Most of our models operate on a 20-second delay. <coughs> Validated, demonstrated to apply to new students and new contexts. So that's a particularly important one because there are a lot of published papers out there where people just say, here's my model of engagement. This is engagement because I say it is, and it's engagement. Or they might have some sort of ground truth measure that they connect to, but they only do it for a very restricted population. And there's something really, truly scary about building a model on a convenience sample of, say, 150 white, mostly upper middle class suburban students in uh, the wealthiest suburb of Worcester, and then, or whatever city, and then applying it to urban and rural students across the country. That, that to me, just scares the heck out of me. My group tries really hard to be better than that whenever we can. We've built these detectors for around a dozen different systems of different profiles, including uh, online, you know, all the systems I showed you a minute ago except for MITx, <clears throat> but you know, also a range of other learning systems uh, that range the gamut from elementary school to adult learners, uh, military populations, everything in between, and domains uh, including mathematics, uh, physical sciences, computer science, um, medicine, and so on. <clears throat> so these kind of detectors that we build, and I'll talk a little more about them as I go on, create a lot of opportunities. First set of opportunities that I care a lot about are improvements to practice. Can we develop systems that recognize when a student's becoming disengaged and adapt to improve engagement? The idea being we figure out, hey, this kid's bored, let's do something about it. Can we assess which materials are less engaging to drive redesign? The idea here being, well, gosh, even if it's not practical to do an intervention in real time, if we can take a system like assessments and find the most boring content in it, we can fix it. And the third one, can we determine which students are less engaged to provide predictive analytics? Maybe it's useful for a teacher to know which students got uh, careless on their homework last night. It also creates opportunities for basic research, and I'll talk about that as well today. So what are the dynamics of student affect and engagement over time? How does student emotion naturally change? And you may remember that the title of this talk was uh, Student Affect Dynamics. So I'll be talking about that one today. What's the duration of different affective states? You know, if somebody gets bored, how long can we expect them to stay bored without intervention? Correspondingly, if a student gets in this really positive affective state, how long can we expect that to continue? Which affective states and which forms of engagement matter in different contexts? So is it always the same types of affect and engagement that are associated with different learning outcomes? Or is there variation uh, for populations or for learning systems? And I said matter, but there's kind of short-term importance and then there's long-term importance. Which affective states and forms of engagement matter for the long term? It might be that something looks very important today, but actually when you get to uh, three years from now, it really didn't matter that it happened. And the things that matter in the long term may not be the same. Uh, may not even seem to matter in the short term. 
I want to kind of connect this back. Basic research is not just in this domain, basic research. It's in Pasteur's quadrant. It's use-inspired. We want to influence practice. So if we want to say what are the dynamics of affect and engagement, we want to say what shifts should we expect naturally? What shifts are kind of a natural shift that we have a greater chance to influence or produce? Um, maybe a student who's bored, we shouldn't try to bring them straight to a state of delight, but we should find some other intermediate state. What's the duration of different affective cycles? Well, which affective states form what DeMello calls vicious cycles, which are hard to disrupt? Maybe if a student gets in some affective state, they just stay there almost no matter what you do once they get there. So we really want to keep them out of it. And you know, in terms of what matter for different contexts in the long term, well, we really want to focus on what matters. And we want to do it for the long term. There's been an increasing, you know, I'm obviously a booster of the educational data mining community, as Dave knows, but one of the criticisms I'd have of that community over the last few years is that increasingly people have become very obsessed with these very immediate problems, like predicting correctness on the next math problem. Those kind of problems are useful, but there's uh, evidence, for instance, that um, there's evidence that often the designs that are most effective at driving short-term learning and engagement are not the ones that drive long-term success. And just one very simple example of that is cramming. Cramming for a test is a good way to do well on that test. It's a terrible way to do well on remembering that three days after the test. Like, there's actually evidence on both those. Memory optimization-wise, if you really cram, you'll probably gain, but the gains will be very short-lived. That's a good example of where short-term and long-term really disagree. So how do the detectors we build of affect and engagement work? Well, they detect it solely from student interactions with the software. So for example, uh, the speed of response. What does a student do after they make a mistake and the system says, here's why you got it wrong? Do they pause and read it? Or do they just go barreling straight forward? Um, if they have a high chance of knowing it, do they still work slowly and carefully? Or do they work, or they answer like in way faster time than should be warranted? We do this solely from interactions with the software in my lab, primarily because sensors raise privacy, political cost, and equity concerns that we prefer to sidestep. Shawnee Daly is a researcher who at the time was at Clemson. She's moved to Georgia, I believe, since then. She did a research study on electrodermal uh, bracelets in uh, US classrooms, managed to land herself on the Glenn Beck Show, if anyone remembers that. Uh, also on various left-wing blogs. She managed the, the impressive feat of, being, of getting hateful like uh, messaging from both sides of the political spectrum. Um, and uh, Wynne Burleson in one study of, uh, po of posture sensor chairs in Holyoke, Massachusetts found that there was like a 60% breakage rate of some of, her, of some of his sensors per day. Students just intentionally would destroy them. If you've ever seen a student pull out a CD drive, and I know that's kind of speaking kind of old school, I talk about CD drives, and put a cup in it, students can be very rough on tech. Now having said that, Although I don't favor uh, sensors for most school contexts, we have actually done work uh, with other groups to, inter to, in to integrate our interaction-based sensors with sensor-based, uh, sorry, inter interaction-based detection approach with physical and physiological sensors. Uh, with Sydney DeMello at Colorado Boulder, we uh, did work to integrate uh, detection based on video cameras. And with James Lester's group at North Carolina State, we did work to integrate postural sensors. What we learned, in case you're curious, is that interaction detectors are either better, in the case of the posture sensors, or not as good, but have additive value still. Um, and the interaction-based detectors, even when video-based detectors are better, interaction-based detectors are usable a much larger percentage of the time. And the reason for that is because video cameras, um, you know, who here is familiar with Roz Picard's work here? Yeah, so Roz has done some great work <coughs> on facial recognition of emotion. But it requires people to be kind of sitting there in a relatively controlled environment. Light, lighting is a big challenge. In classrooms, we noticed several problems to it. One of them, students talk and kind of lean over to talk to their neighbor, and they're not on camera anymore. Second, um, students sometimes wear hats, even if they're not supposed to. Students sometimes chew gum, even if they're not supposed to. And students sometimes drink water. All those things make it hard to recognize someone's facial expression. Again, that's not meant to say it's not a great technology, because in fact, in that study, it got much better quality than ours did when it applied. But interaction-based detectors have a broader proportion of time they can be used. Now, being fair, 
if you've got a system where interaction is not seen in the system, where students are like doing work on paper, you're not going to see that in an interaction-based detector. So it does work better with some types of uh, interactions than others. <clears throat> so I promised earlier I would talk about what we're actually studying. Some of the primary constructs we model, off-task behavior, when a student completely disengages from the learning environment and the task to engage in an unrelated behavior. For example, if somebody in this room were to say be surfing Facebook, that would be off-task behavior. I'm sure no one here is doing that, but you know. Gaming system, David was, Dave was kind enough to, uh, to foreshadow this one. I define gaming as intentionally misusing educational software to succeed without learning. So things like systematic guessing. One time in the log files, we saw a student who entered one, and it was wrong. They entered two, and it was wrong. They entered three, and it was wrong. Four, five, six, seven. 38 was the correct answer. And they got there, one to 38. Now, did they get the answer? Yes. Did they learn? Probably not. Another one, a lot of systems give students hints. And if you ask for another hint, it gives you a more detailed hint. And eventually, you can get to a bottom out hint. Now, some students will you know, read a hint, and they think about it. And then they read another hint, and they think about it, and they struggle. And finally, they get to the bottom out hint, and they sit there, and they think. Uh, ben Shi at Carnegie Mellon studied this behavior, very appropriate help-seeking behavior. You learn a lot from that. Other students go, hint, 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 type the answer. Hint, 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 type the answer. Not as beneficial. Careless errors, making errors despite knowing the relevant skills or concepts. Everybody can get careless sometimes. Some students get careless more than others. So for example, if someone in this room was asked six times nine and said 42, it'd probably be because you weren't listening very carefully to the question. <coughs> Affect, emotion and context. We've studied, among other things, engaged concentration, which is positive focused concentration towards the task where you become completely absorbed in the activity, time drops away, you know, everything else drops away. The emotion that I'm sure you're all experiencing right now. <laughs> and if not, don't tell me otherwise. It's related to Chikshant Mihai's construct of flow. But unlike flow, which kind of implies a lot of theoretical baggage, like it implies that we think the challenge is really perfectly matched the task, uh, engaged concentration is just the emotion associated with that. Boredom. Um, many, everyone here has probably experienced boredom sometimes. Frustration, confusion, delight. I didn't have that on the slide, but we have detected delight in a few cases. <clears throat> How do we build these models? First, we get human assessments of engagement and disengagement synchronized to the log files from the educational software. Uh, we, I, I, skipped my, I took out my slide on this because I didn't want to spend too much time on this, but basically we have a protocol which we've honed over the years that now has over 150 people trained in it in four countries for collecting student, data on student emotion in a very rigorized fashion using field observation. Field observation turns out to be equally reliable as video actually a little easier to get reliable than video, and much, much cheaper to collect. So if we want to collect thousands of observations, it's just way cheaper to go out to the field and just walk around with a handheld than it is to watch video. Self-report's another thing some people have used. Interestingly, self-report and, self and field observation don't tend to agree with each other very, at all, very, all, very well at all. And that's an interesting dilemma for the field. They actually correlate to the same uh, other things, but they don't correlate well with each other. They're both relatively noisy measures, probably for different reasons. A human observer might get it wrong sometimes, even though our human observers agree with each other more than 60% uh, better than the base rate, often up to 80%. Um, Self-report has a different problem, which is simply that a lot of people aren't always willing to say how they feel. And some of them are not even fully aware of it. I just wanted to Yeah, please, go for it. It's a really fascinating thing you're talking about. Are you saying that um, the people who are <coughs> assessing the students for uh, engagement, then you map that to the keystroke behavior that is labeled now as the behavior of someone who's engaged as opposed to someone who's not. Exactly. Okay, got it. You're a half slide ahead of me. Oh, okay. So that's perfect. Thank you. Yes. So we take those field observations, we log them on the phone, uh, we synchronize it with an internet time server to what's going on in the software. We actually look at semantic behaviors more than we look at keystrokes, although we have done one project that looked at keystrokes. <coughs> um, we then use data mining machine learning algorithms that, to develop models that replicate those human judgments using just the interaction data. So our classic approach to doing this, what we did for years and years, we synchronized the log data of the field observations. We distill meaningful data features for the learning environment. 
excuse me, <coughs> based on uh, various things, including a qualitative study of the log files, the experience of the field observers, what they actually saw, and past experience of their data sets. As we did more and more of these, we've gotten more and more familiar with the process. Typically, uh, we have a brainstorming process where we get together machine learning folks, uh, affect research in the field observers, give them pizza, give them beer, come up with a bunch of ideas. The beer is an essential part of the process. Um, <coughs> some of our researchers don't drink. It's a real problem. Um, <coughs> Uh, but it's semantic features, for example, like in a simulation, did they pause the simulation or not? How many variables did they change between runs? In an intelligent tutor, how many seconds did they pause after making an error before putting in the next answer? Things like that. We develop an automated detector using classification algorithms, and we validate that model for new students. So we build the model on some students, test on others. New content, new lessons, build the model on some lessons, test on others. And new populations. Uh, we build the model on suburban and urban students, test on rural students. That last one, by the way, is still relatively uncommon in the field, which is a real problem, because we've often found that our models don't generalize across populations, unless we put some real attention to that. In particular, in America, so far our experience has been that rural kids are way more different from suburban and urban than suburban and urban are from each other, which is not what we initially expected. We thought that you know suburban kids, mostly, mostly white, uh, rural kids, mostly white, in our samples. They're going to be more like each other than the mostly African-American and Latino students we were, we were working with in the, in the cities. Turned out to not be the case at all. The, uh, er, the students in the inner cities and the students in the suburbs were way more similar to each other in terms of behavior and what detectors work than the rural kids were. <coughs> so what'd you say? Um, I just think that makes so much sense to me, coming yeah. from a rural area where you're bored all the time. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and you know, this uh, just, see, I should ask you to make a, I should ask them to make predictions beforehand. When I've done that in the past, other people have, most people have been surprised, but I think that also has to do a lot with academic audiences often don't have too many people who grew up in really rural areas. Now, interestingly, by the way, actually, maybe this talks about the experience of the boredom that you mentioned. Students in rural areas tend to be way less disengaged when they use online learning than students in urban and suburban areas do in the United States. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you know, historically when we did this, we used classical machine learning algorithms like decision trees, decision rules, functional classifiers, instance based classifiers, so on. And boy, there was like three years where I couldn't give a talk without somebody saying, Excuse me, haven't you ever heard of neural networks, deep learning, you know, this revolution going on that you're completely unaware of? <coughs> Well, we've tried using neural, uh, deep learning, recurrent neural networks. <clears throat> we've done two papers on it now. In Botello et al. 2017, we had the initial appearance of much better performance in assessments. We were getting 10 percentage points better. When we unpacked it, we were doing almost perfect for urban and suburban students and almost at chance for rural students. Continued work has never gotten our models good for the rural students in that sample. So, I don't know what to make of that because in that case, I kind of have the situation of, well, I could say, let's just use the deep learning model in the suburban and the urban contexts. But the fact that the model is so unstable, is, is that sufficiently unstable and doesn't work for some groups, makes me really nervous that we'll go to another city and it'll just fail. Part of the thing is when we use the classical approaches with semantic feature engineering, we actually know what our model's saying. We can inspect it and think about it, which gives us more confidence that we're getting the right thing. When you have a complete uninspectable model, which is unstable across contexts, it just makes me nervous. <clears throat> Even though in some cases we're getting 10 percentage points better. In the other case, which was in a system called Betty's Brain, which is a concept mapping learning tool, we had about equal performance from deep learning and classical algorithms, uh, with one being better than the other by about two or three percentage points in different cases. So that's not to say we've given up on using deep learning and other kind of very contemporary approaches, but we are kind of taking it with a grain of salt and with a little bit of caution. <clears throat> I do think that one difference we have, a lot of these uh, contemporary approaches are basic, have been developed on and are mostly used on situations with massive amounts of data. We never have more than a few thousand observations. Even collecting a few thousand observations of kids' emotion is really expensive. We've thought about doing active learning. We actually have a couple grant proposals in to do active learning to try to 
optimize our learning process on the hardest cases. But even still, we're never going to have data sets of millions of examples of this. <coughs> or at least I don't see how. So I guess I, I cut my slide. I must have done that intentionally. I cut my slide on how good these are. Uh, uh, they actually achieve AUCROC, uh, area under the ROC curve, or ability to tell a board student from a non-board student, for example. Very different between different situations, but typically we're getting AUC ROCs in the, point six, the mid to high point sixes or low point sevens. The one deep learning case was hitting the high point sevens, low point eight. Um, <coughs> now you might say that's pretty weak numbers, and it is, except one of the neat things is we can use these detectors at very large scale. And I'll talk about some of their ability to predict things when aggregated. So uses detectors. I'm going to talk first about what are the dynamics of student affect and engagement over time. So there's been a lot of research into what affective states precede and follow each other. Started with a couple papers in 2007. Dozens of publications since then. Uh, the work has mostly involved sequences of field observations or self-report, which is limited amounts of data. Um, <clears throat> by nature, only you know, maybe at most 3,000 total data points, but also there are only a small number per any given student. And there's relatively long gaps between two observations of the same student. Because when we do these observations, we go around the room in a round robin order. If I just stand over David, he's eventually going to notice I'm looking at him. You know, even if I'm doing, our protocol involves a lot of techniques for reducing observer effects and not appearing like we're looking at somebody. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Well, I know you're not looking at me, yeah. actually, really. Yeah, that's right. Because with our protocol, if I'm staring at David, I'm probably through peripheral observation noticing that you're smiling. <laughs> um, but. The point is, still, if we watch one student too, for too regularly, we do have an observer effect. In recent work, uh, Botello, a brilliant graduate student at WPI, Worcester Polytechnic, applied these automated detectors to a larger data set. Context, again, the assessments platform, which I showed you a picture of earlier. Um, we had 48,000 20 second segments of affect by 838 students. <clears throat> Assistance has 50,000 kids a year. We only did this on 800 because they were the 800 that we'd actually built the detectors on. And we figured to be, you know, if we wanted to really trust the detectors as much as possible, we don't need more data than this. This is already an enormous amount of data for this kind of analysis. Lots of statistical power. We looked to see whether a transition from an affective state P to an affective state N, previous to next, occurs more often than you'd expect by the base rate of it. So in other words, if students are frustrated 72% of the time, not the case in the system. Uh, but if they were, and we said that students after they're bored are frustrated 68% of the time, it sounds like a lot, but it's actually less than the base rate. We use a formula called DeMello's L here, <clears throat> which basically says that the, probabil the probability of going from, I'm sorry, probability of going from the previous state to the next state is the probability of the next state given the previous state minus the probability of the next state over 1 minus the probability of the next state. Very simple formula, related to Cohen's kappa, but not actually the same. And then we compared our findings to DeMello and Gracer's theoretical model of affective dynamics. This is a very popular model in the literature, hundreds of citations. <coughs> Everyone loves this model. Uh, it basically says that students who are in a state of engaged concentration can become confused, and students who are confused can go back to engaged concentration. If you are confused, you can become frustrated, and if you're frustrated, you can become bored. Does this hold up on our data? So the answer is that some things were found and some things weren't found. Um, actually, I'm going to use my cursor here. Maybe that'll work. Can you guys see my cursor? You cannot see my cursor. That will not help. So overall, we found that students did go back and forth between engaged concentration and confusion. That's the loop over to the left. However, um, students did not go from, excuse me, students did not go from confusion to frustration, did not go from frustration to boredom. Instead, a lot of students went straight from confusion to boredom, and then came back from boredom to frustration, frustration to confusion. So this affective model doesn't, that we saw doesn't look much at all like what, yes, sir? How do you identify what state uh, constitutes confusion versus frustration versus boredom? So we're using those automated detectors, and we're making inference from them what the probabilities of each of the states are according to the detectors. The detectors themselves, this was the case where they were based on uh, deep learning. So it's kind of inscrutable to figure out what the exact model is. But it's based on these features of time taken, patterns of correctness, 
and the relationship between those two, student knowledge, things like that. And again, those are originally based, those are originally made to agree with human raters. So yeah, so we're taking the detectors, we're applying them, and then we're seeing are the patterns in line with the Mello and Gracer's theory. In terms of engaged concentration and confusion looping, they are, but in terms of the negative affective states, they don't look the same. Yes, ma'am. What is no label? Oh, that just means there's some cases where the detectors don't, uh, can't confidently uh, agree on any of them. So none of them get above 50%. Yes, sir. I guess those human readers, how are they telling the difference between those states when they're looking at those initial metrics? <coughs> so our training process involves uh, 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 learning to conduct holistic coding. People within culture, are pretty good at recognizing affective states in a way that they agree with other people. So there have been approaches like uh, Ekman's facial action coding system. Who here is familiar with FACS? So one hand. So FACS involves, in its original formulation, very specific lip curl, eyebrow raise, looking for combinations of those features. It turns out that the integrated reliability of FACS is actually pretty poor. FACS has been very, very useful for machine vision work and affect recognition by computers, but human beings actually don't agree very well when they try to use facts. We go the opposite extreme and just say, if you're in the same culture as somebody and you're uh, neurotypical, you can recognize emotion to, to, some to a pretty good degree and you can agree with other people. So our process is involved in an intuitive understanding of what boredom is, intuitive understanding of frustration, and, make, and the process, the training mostly just involves helping people to activate their ability to kind of look at multiple cues at once. So that's kind of a, a vague answer, and part of the reason is because human beings are good. This is one of these things that human beings are good at recognizing, but very bad at explaining how they recognize it. Mm -hmm. And programs, for example, that treat people with, with uh, autism <coughs> spectrum disorder, how to recognize emotions, it's a very tricky thing to do. Yes, ma'am. I just have a question about this idea of boredom, because I'm just thinking about how we actually learn and things like creative thought and things where in some sense, you have to take your mind off of a specific task in a way to come up with a new idea. And so I, I wonder if we are designing systems that remove boredom. Do we actually know what the potential harm, like pitfalls on actual deep and creative learning would be? It's a wonderful question. I don't think we've, so we have succeeded in creating less boring systems. I haven't seen the evidence that those systems seem to be negative for student outcomes. But at the same time, it's obvious that a certain degree of ability to tolerate and, uh, and deal with boredom is important. I'll talk about our correlational results connecting boredom to certain things. What I can say is, and we'll show the kind of some of the correlations for boredom in a, in a few minutes, <clears throat> at the very least, probably boredom during mathematics problem solving probably isn't beneficial, even if it may be beneficial in other contexts. There's also the issue of we can't really tell the difference between types of frustration and types of confusion from this method. Actually, some of our other work, which I think I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, actually shows that, that confusion and frustration have different implications based on their duration. Should I go on to that, actually? So I'll talk about duration of affective states. So previous work has been relatively limited on studying how long affect lasts. There's one lab study over short durations by DeMello and Gracer before us on this. <coughs> Um, there's some phenomenological and experiential work, but I'm kind of talking about work that's scaled here. I may be missing a study or two, but in our recent work, we anal analyzed the duration of affect on the same larger assessments data set and found that affect was much more persistent in our classroom setting than in DeMello's lab study, which in a way is not surprising. If you're doing a task that you don't care about particularly just because you're being paid $6, you may not have the same emotions as when you're taking, doing a class activity for a grade. So this graph shows the persistence of the different affective states over time. The probability, if you're in it, that you stay in it. So how many seconds is the student staying in it for each of these affective states? And you can see, for example, that students who are confused, it drops off really sharply. Confusion doesn't last nearly as long as boredom or engaged concentration, which have much longer durations. To the point where students, uh, after five minutes, a student who is in engaged concentration is almost 50-50 to still be in it. So there's a great stickiness to engage concentration and boredom that confusion and frustration don't have. <clears throat> so
So what affect and engagement matters? I guess I did not have that slide, so let me really quickly say that other comment I wanted to say on duration of boredom and confusion. A study by Lou et al. Uh, in my group found that students who became, became confused or frustrated for a short period of time had very good learning outcomes. Students who became confused or frustrated for a long time had very negative learning outcomes. So to me, that signals kind of the important role. Becoming confused, if you never get confused, you're probably not learning. You have to struggle to some degree to learn. But if you get confused and you stay confused for several minutes, which is fairly rare, as you can see from this data, like it's rare to become confused for, I think in our case it was three minutes. It's almost, you know, together it's almost like 12%, although it's a little more when you conclude confusion, frustration, frustration, confusion mixes. But it's fairly rare, but when you do stay, it's a signal that the student is really struggling that we should probably do something about. <coughs> so which engagement and, and disengage, which engagement and affective states matter? Um, there's high consistency for behavioral disengagement across studies. Gaming the system has been associated with negative learning outcomes in several studies. Carelessness has been associated with negative learning outcomes in several studies when we control for the student's initial knowledge. That's an important point because carelessness tends to be the uh, disengaged behavior of students who are doing well in general. In other words, students who are struggling don't tend to disengage by becoming careless nearly as often as students who are doing well. I, I tell my son that all the time, you know, because um, off-task behavior is not particularly associated with negative learning outcomes in online learning. Teachers spend so much time in classes that use learning technologies trying to keep their kids on task, and there's several studies that suggest it doesn't matter. The one exception is, is notable in its own right. It's uh, Kostuk et al. It's in a system called Reasoning Mind, which is so good at keeping kids involved that off-task behavior almost never occurs. So off-task behavior averages around 15 to 25% in most systems, rarely below 10%. In reasoning mind, it's below 3%. And in that system, off-task behavior has this huge correlation negative with learning, which I suspect is because once you've gotten rid of all of the kind of incidental taking a break for a second, kind of neutral forms of off-task behavior, you're left only with the kids who are completely checked out. So that's another one of these tricks about you know the semantics of even what looks like a fairly unitary construct. In affect, there's more variation. Um, college student lab studies uh, found that boredom was negatively associated with outcomes. Engaged concentration and confusion were positively associated. A college programming study found boredom and confusion negatively, so confusion's a different sign in this study, and I think that's because these earlier studies weren't looking at duration. Engaged concentration positively. Another study with middle school mathematics, boredom negative, engaged concentration positive. A stats MOOC, confusion, frustration, anxiety, and hope negatively associated. They didn't have a good explanation for why hope was associated with worse outcomes, but I guess it means that you hope you'll do okay when you're struggling. They didn't explain it. And finally, a study of military cadets found frustration negatively associated with outcomes. The only one of these studies that found a correlation in any direction for frustration didn't find a correlation for boredom or any of the others. So there's this really un uneven pattern. Um, so design of curriculum materials. How does the design of, wait. Something went, I'm gonna slide around because I made a mistake in my slides. I apologize, I deleted something. So when we correlate them to longer term outcomes, for example, standardized exam score, in the systems we find that, standardized, that gaming system correlates to standardized exam score at a correlation of negative 0.36 which is about the same correlation as the correlation between smoking and lifespan. People in the hard sciences often you know, say correlation of negative 0.36 is small, but I think for education it's pretty big. Engaged concentration and Sarah's exam score plus 0.36, boredom negative 0.2. College attendance, we applied the detectors to data from 2004 to 2007. The detectors can predict whether a student will go to college or not six years later. Um, Student knowledge, engaged concentration, and carelessness associated with going to college. Gaming system, boredom, confusion associated with not going to college. Now, you may say, wait a minute, carelessness is associated with going to college? It turns out it's positively associated with college until you control for student knowledge, and then it's associated with not going to college. So that's yet more evidence for this kind of claim that carelessness is a disengaged behavior of generally successful students. <coughs> 
selective college. These detectors can predict whether students go to a selective college. MIT versus, say, uh, your competition down the street. You can pick which competition I'm talking about. Uh, we use the Barron's classifications for selectivity. STEM major. So gaming system and carelessness are the same flip. Gaming system and carelessness in middle school math are associated with whether you major in STEM when you get to college. Incidentally, gaming system is strongly associated with one specific non-STEM major. If you gaming system in middle school, there's one, there's one major you're very likely to do in college. Two majors, actually. Does anyone want to guess? Sorry? Business. Business. That's right. The other one is social work, which I actually think has a positive connotation because social work is often about making, figuring out how, ways to make systems work for people. <laughs> so to summarize, how do we use this information? We want to try to advance the science of learning, empower teachers and guidance counselors, and uh, provide automated intervention and individualization. There have been a lot of scientific discoveries enabled by these methods. You've seen a sample from my research group today. I skipped a few slides just in the interest of time where I talked about how we were able to tell what different content was associated and in terms of some scientific principles. We create reports for instructors, guidance counselors, and course designers with data on long-term student trajectories along with each student's risk factors. Uh, I won't try to go into the details because they're relatively complex, but they show for different students all these different factors we're detecting and what the <coughs> risk is relative to them. We also um, have worked with Reasoning Mind to, to, to deploy reports on student engagement to regional coordinators. These were used to figure out which teachers had the least engaged students to then give professional development to those teachers on how to teach effectively with learning technology. <coughs> reports on disengagement to instructors. It's work I've done with uh, University of Pennsylvania's online learning initiative and the Penn Center for Learning Analytics where we study what content is associated with learner ceasing participation in a MOOC. So a lot of people talk a lot about, uh, d about MOOC stop out, and they may develop predictive models. We tried to figure out what was the last content the students saw before they dropped the course. And so if you go from left to right, you can see that the very first video was in fact the video that most people stopped out after. That's not shocking, right? And that second spike is the last video of week one. Again, not shocking. But check that video out over to the right. That's the last video of week three. So it turns out that the course's materials kind of start to get a lot harder at that point. <coughs> sorry, not the last. That's, I think, the Sorry, it's, this, it's not the last. It's a specific video in week three where the content gets significantly harder. And that video, a lot of people just stop there. <coughs> Similarly, what's the last assignment seen before dropping out over completing the course? And you can see that there's this pattern here that's not quite as telling as the one for the videos. Automated intervention and individualization. So uh, we created an agent called Scooter the Tutor, who looked happy when students were using the software appropriately, got mad when they were using it inappropriately. Scooter led to about a half as much gaming and helped students who were gaming catch up to non-gaming students, whereas usually they fall behind. Uh, students, did they like Scooter? Well, it turned out that the students who never got any help from Scooter loved Scooter, said he helped their learning. The students who got these interventions and had significantly better learning said they hated Scooter and he hurt their learning. There was also a group of middle school boys who competed to see who, was the who could be the first one to make Scooter catch fire. <laughs> Inkits, <clears throat> this is a system uh, used for, for, high school si for sorry, middle school science simulations. I mentioned it earlier. That's Rex. Rex is saying, I'm not sure if you can read it, hey, are you just playing with the buttons? Take your learning seriously or I will eat you. <laughs> TC3SIM is a military, uh, military medical um, learning system. A frustration detector was used to trigger multiple interventions. DeFalco tried several, and she found that a social identity intervention that emphasized to frustrated students their identity as, military, as members of the military was the one that most helped them persist through their frustration. So to conclude really quickly, basic research on affect and engagement is ongoing. The goal is more engaging and positive affective experiences for learners, and ultimately better learning outcomes and long-term participation. If you're interested in learning any more, uh, we have our MOOC, Big Day in Education. Uh, our lab publications are available online, Google Ryan Baker. I am not the uh, linebacker for the Miami, Miami Dolphins, in case you couldn't tell. 
Um, and we have a Twitter and Facebook feed that are low traffic and basically only announce our uh, newest publications. Yes, ma'am. When is that uh, move running again? I guess it's archived at the moment. <coughs> so it's currently archived. Uh, the next run will probably be in the spring. But all the materials are available right now, even though it's not in session. Yes, sir. You talked about, I think, the use of technology and the sensors to keep it entirely automated for privacy concerns. Am I understanding correctly that that's what you're doing rather than having humans aware? Well, so actually, uh, what we're doing with regards to sensors is we're only using interaction data. We're not using physical sensors because a lot of, uh, a lot of parents and pundits are deeply concerned about the idea of video cameras in schools or galvanic skin response bracelets. Um, in terms of privacy, there's not typically a right, uh, an expectation of privacy that middle school students, teachers, won't know what's going on with them. Um, and in general, there's kind of not that expectation in education. We're not particularly worried about that, but I do think it's important that that information not be widely disseminated in, in, an, in an identifiable form. So I'm thinking about the potential longitudinal value of that data for a given learner, um, and it maybe sort of is related to short-term confusion versus longer-term confusion, but I'm imagining over years of, of a student's learning experience, that record could be really valuable, but also uh, presenting bigger and bigger privacy Concerns. And so we, we have this, long, the, we call it the Assessments Longitudinal Data Sample, where we've now tracked students from seventh grade uh, through to their first job post-college. I didn't talk about those results yet because, uh, largely because uh, that's still being processed by the community. We actually opened up those. So whereas in earlier stages up to this one, we'd done it all internally, we took our job data and we made it available to everybody in the world uh, who would sign a data agreement. It is de-identified pretty carefully. Like, we're only giving digestions of the data that would be pretty hard to identify a real student from. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important. I think that we can gain a lot of value from this kind of longitudinal data. The questions on how to use it appropriately are interesting ones. At the moment, um, there's a lot of longitudinal data available on students that is not particularly well secured at the school and district level. Um, often it's secured solely by obscurity. But uh, figuring out how to use that as a society, in a way that, be that benefits students, but also doesn't either violate privacy or trap students into the trajectory they're in in second grade is really important. Yes, ma'am. So I'm really interested in what you were saying about population differences, right? And uh, you didn't mention gender at all, right? That's you right. You mentioned rural and urban. So I didn't mention gender. Uh, largely because we have not analyzed it. We did not have access directly to gender data from our original collection. What we did was actually, in some recent work that is about to be submitted in about a week, we actually retrospectively went back and used some, uh, some algorithms to try to figure out, uh, figure out sex from name, which is not perfect, so we have to have some certain degree of error, and we're gonna try to use that. Uh, we largely weren't using it because up until recently we didn't know a good way to try to infer it without having that actual data. And I still, I still get a little cringy about, about our error rates, about inferring sex. There are some names that are very obviously uh, related to male or female, and there are some that aren't. But yeah, uh, Ivana Arroyo is a researcher at Worcester Polytechnic who's done a lot more work on that than we have because she had the luck to work with, well, in our case, we've, our team has only ever worked with developers who already have that data on hand, and so we just have to work with what they've got. Um, Yvonne had the good fortune to be designing her own system and actually collected it from the start. Great. Well, thank you all for your attendance, your questions. If you have further ones, I'm around Boston a lot, so shoot me an email.